Whiskey Jason here, whiskey from the viewpoint of an American in Germany. Um, today I'm in Scotland, but I have a German bottling. So today I have Cattle Hill from whiskey.de, and this is the 11 year old blended malt scotch whiskey, which is a sherry bottling. I showed this in my other um, video here in the comparison with Horst. This is the second bottling, and this is the first. I did in the wrong order, I'm so sorry. So this came out first, and this came out second within weeks of each other. So this is 11 years old, 46%, €39.90. This is sherry, sherry, sherry with a little portion of first fill bourbon. And it's whiskey base number 170460. Now, um, <coughs> excuse me, there were 3,000 bottles of this as well as what from the Horst 10-year-old um, bourbon uh, blend. And this was also made or yeah, produced by the Angus Dundee Distillers. So they belong, um, Glen Cadham as well as Tom and Tao belong to them. I don't think either of the distilleries make such sherried whiskies on a general basis. So what happens is, is they actually share and they, they trade cast back and forth to create things like this. There are more than one distillery in this, that's why it's blended. Now, um, in my video here with the 10 year old with the horse looning um, whiskey, I made a very, very um, um, courageous statement. I said 95% of the people I do not think are able to di differentiate between a single malt and a blended malt. And I'm sure many of you are like, oh, yes I can. It's like, no you can't. So you can differentiate between a blended scotch with grain and a um, single malt, but you probably can't differentiate between a blended malt and a single malt. I can't. Now, why can't I? Well, first of all, it's sherry forward. So as soon as you let something sit in a sherry cask for maybe 11 years, you're not going to be really able to find out what distillery is behind it anyways, because it's sherry dominated. And the second thing is, is every single bottle that we have, except for single cask, are basically blends. You, bl you blend various barrels together. Some are more, some are less um, off the profile, and um, you just have to blend. And what you do also with different distilleries is you blend. Now, as long as you stay in one region, basically with the same type of whiskey, non-peated, um, non sherried um, whiskeys, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between a Glen Cadham and a Tomental or a Glen Fittich or a Bablea or anything else to, for that matter, in my opinion. Um, you will be able to tell the difference between a um, Glen Fittich sherried and a Atbeck sherried because of the peat. Now, as long as you stay with unpeated, you're probably going to be in a very, very similar realm. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share, I'm going to compare this to um, something I have here. Which one was it? Yep. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I already just did this. Um, I should sing in English as well. It's raining, man. Hallelujah, it's raining, man. So if you ever watch um, Rex and Daniel, you know that when a bottle's killed, you have to sing. And I poured the rest into my glass to compare it with this. First of all, the color. Um, the Berry Brothers and Rudd um, Sherry Cast Matured Blended Malt Scotch Whiskey. I've had this bottle for about two years now. Is much darker. And while they were making this, um, they had certain samples and they mixed it together. And Horst was talking about it in his German video about how they got lucky that it's very, very, very similar to their samples. Because what happens is if you take 3,000 liters, so let's think, um, this is all sherry butts. So a sherry butt is around 500 liters. So you take about five sherry butts and you might add one sherry, I'm sorry, one first fill bourbon cask. Boom, put it on a marriaging tank and you let it sit there for six to 12 weeks. Within those six to 12 weeks, it does have a little bit of a shift in its flavor profile. It can go up, it can go down um, with the sherry, it can go left and it can rug a right. It can be sweeter, it can get more tart. It can do a lot of different things in that time. Because when you do your samples, you just don't have that same thing, even though you take the same thing from the those barrels that were there before and um, luckily um, at least Ben said here Ben Luding said we were spot on this time and it has to do with a little bit of luck and so you actually it's interesting when you're blending that is like well let's see what happens 
And that's the um, that's a craftsmanship. That's a genius. That's the experience of master blenders. They go, oh, I've done this before. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. It's going to go left. It's going to go right. It's going to go forward. It's going to go back. All those three different dimensions that we have here, things can happen. And they were very, very happy with this whiskey. Let's see if I'm happy with this whiskey. On the nose, it's got a very, very nice aroma. It's not an um, Oroloso, um, it's not a Pedro Jimenez, I have no idea what type of sherry it was. The first fill bourbon and the sherry together works wonderfully together. I had a Kirsch import from um, Edredawa, they did exactly the same, same things. They took three sherry butts, I think three sherry, um, I said first fill bourbon cask, mixed them together. I loved it. And also here I'm getting a wonderful, wonderful nose. On the nose it's a bee. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what this is, but I don't know what it is. I... Wow. Very, very nice. And there's something underneath. It's almost like an anise. It's almost like a type of... Um, sweet wood... Um, there's something underneath there that's just going. It's, it's a type of it's a type of root. I m once made a gin. Sorry for saying so. I was a distiller of the day, and we made rye whiskey. And of course, rye whiskey takes three to five years to actually mature. And so we took some of um, the new make of the day before, which was basically vodka, and we put our own little botanicals in there. And I put way too much of this root, angelica root, is what it's called in German. Is that right? Angelica root? That's what I'm getting here. Angelica root. And it just just ruined it. And that's what I'm getting here, a little bit of Angelica root. It takes it from a B down to a B minus down to a to a C plus. It's not bad. It's a very good whiskey. But it's not just wowing me as I... The first um, sip I had in Germany, I was like, wow, this is fantastic. And the second sip was like, wow, this is okay. And the third was like, nah, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually a C++ um, type of whiskey. Now, going over here to the Berry Brothers and Rudd, what I get here is a more... A, a, let's, let's call this a more of advanced a sherry whiskers whiskey. A sherry uh, drinker's whiskey. This is more of the typical sherry notes I would expect. I'm a little bit off here, to be honest, with my sherry notes. And the more I drink this, the, the more it goes off target, which is really interesting. So over here, uh, get the brown sugars, get the fruits, get the, get the raisins, get the sultans. Mmm. Today, this is the B minus whiskey for me. If I want a sherry bomb, I would actually go for a blended um, malt scotch whiskey. I don't know many blended scotch malt whiskeys that have a sherry focus. Cadenhead has a really unique 12 year old, I think a 22 year old. And then it's like, who else? Um, Berry Brothers and Rudd, Whiskey.D, and who else has a malted, not a scotch? Um, blend, but um, a blended malt where we just have no grain and 100% um, different malt whiskeys blended together with a sherry focus. Help me. What else do you know out there? Um, this I would choose. I would give this actually today a B minus. This is a C plus. Value for money, this is a C. It's not bad. 3,000 bottles. I am definitely sure that some of these bottles are going to make it up into the auctions. There's going to be some people in Germany that buy five of these and put three of them in auction hope that they get more than the 40 euros they paid for it because um, whiskey.de only sends to Germany and Austria now. Um, they might expand one day, but international customers have to find, find a way to get around that. Um, and one of the ways is to get things like this as an auction. Unique, nice, but not wow. I do prefer it over this. I gave this actually a solid C. Um, this is a C plus, and I would rather prefer the sherry. One last comment that I'd like to make is the question of the day is, what is more difficult to make? Is it a sherry cask, or is it a ex-bourbon cask? I personally think the ex-bourbon cask is more difficult to make. Why? Because um, 
a, it's the ex bourbon. Let's take an ex bourbon hogshead for example. Any blemish you have is like a spotlight. It's like a flashlight, like a torch that you just focus on that thing. And sherry kind of covers a lot of the of the blemishes. I'm sure with a sherry you can actually um, take a whiskey that's mediocre and turn it into something nice. And take a um, ex um, bourbon hogshead matured whiskey and say it's okay and it'll turn into something that's less than okay <laughs> all right so i think you know what i'm talking about bourbon's more difficult ex-bourbon casks are more b difficult to perfect than it is a sherry sure throw in the sherry hope for the best and you'll get something good and in this case it's the same thing that happened here all right thank you very much for watching please like please subscribe to you please tell others about this crazy guy over in germany tasting bottles where you only have three thousand of these and three thousand of those and I have no idea how many we had of this. I think also maybe about 5,000. Um, there weren't that many actually produced of this. I don't even know if it made it all around the world or not. But mine is empty and I'm a little bit sad about it. Thank you very much for watching. All the best. Whiskey Jason here. See you soon. Bye-bye.